We are grateful that our distinguished moderator and panelists could find time to join us. And so let us begin with our moderator, who has done much research on millennials and uh, generation work in the workplace and uh, all the things that make millennials interesting to us. He is the publisher and editor of Crane's Detroit Business. He's an award-winning author, journalist, and renowned political commentator. He is a former White House correspondent and Washington bureau chief for the Associated Press during the Clinton, Bush, and Obama presidencies. He proudly moved back to his native Detroit last fall for a new prof professional opportunity at Crane's. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ron Fournier. I'm too old to do that because I'm not a millennial. Thank you, Dan, very much. I'd like to thank uh, Paul Bond, too, my twin brother. As he keeps telling everybody, we go to the same barber. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, just to set the table for what's going to be a great conversation, I'll keep this really quick. Um, in 2005, I've been covering the White House for about 12 years, and I got an opportunity to go to um, um, Harvard University and, and uh, be a fellow at the Institute of Politics. I'm going to Harvard was a pretty cool thing. I went to school at the University of Detroit, which I still think is the Harvard or Woodward Avenue. <laughs> so it was a step down to go to the IOP for a semester. Um, and there I began researching a book um, that, that ended up being um, a, a real deep dive into what successful political, business, and religious leaders, what are the attributes that they share. And the one thing we realized uh, really quickly was first, the three of us who were writing it weren't smart enough to do it. Uh, we had to get a research team. So I, I dipped into the the Harvard class of that year, um, uh, the kids who were kids who were <laughs> who were studying at the Harvard Institute of Politics, and had them help us on the research. Um, and one thing we realized real, real, right away with these these youngsters was we really had to understand them if we want to understand where the future of politics were going, if we want to understand where the future of business were, were going. That we were surrounded by the future. Uh, matter of fact, one of them was a young man named Joe Green who was uh, rooming. His roommate was Zuckerberg. This is in 2005. And I remember as, as I'm trying to figure out at the time what the social media thing was about and how this generation was connecting with each other differently than past generations, he told me about this thing they were working on called The Facebook and asked me if I'd be willing to help on it. I said, no, I'm too busy working on the book, <laughs> proving once again that I'm not the smartest guy in the room. Um, and so what was happening at Harvard at the time that we were working on this book was John Delavopi, the pollster for the Harvard Institute of Politics, was in his... Uh, fourth year of polling about the generation. Now remember the oldest millennials at the time were still in high school. And what he was finding already that this was a generation with some very unique attributes. A generation with a set of attributes that you can only compare to maybe four other generations. And he found that all the attributes kind of came out of the times that they were raised in. And this, this, the, the study that John has done and the work that John's, John was doing at the time has been replicated again and again and again by other pollsters, other social scientists. And it's all based in the period that we live in, the period that we're raised in, because we are all, when we were all young men and women, we were shaped by our times. And this is a generation that came up at a time of almost unprecedented change, huge economic change. We're not talking about the, the downturn in 2008. We're talking about going from the industrial era to wherever the hell it is we're going into on top of huge technological change, the kind of technological change that we haven't seen since the beginning of the industrial era, on top of huge demographic change, the face of the nation is literally changing. The kindergarten class, actually now the second grade class of America is majority minority, and that wave was already coming in 2005. So the only generations that you can look back in our history to see that have come up at a time of huge change like that, that have been shaped by these massive currents of change, technology, a really tough economic transition, and demography. Millennials, by the way, are a majority-minority generation, the world's, the, the, this country's largest and most diverse generation. The only other generations that came up a time like that, if you think about it, is uh, the, the greatest generation. Think of the times they were raised in, in the early part of the 19th, 20th century. Lincoln's generation and the founding generation. So the millennial generation is what sociologists call the fourth civic generation. Because one of the things they share with these other generations is an off-the-charts involvement in community service. They want to give something back. They want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And we're finding out it's not just for the college applications, folks. <laughs> Even after they get out of college and they get out in the world, they're looking for purpose. Studies show that millennials would take less money, for example, at their place of work if their employer will make them feel like they're a part of something bigger than themselves. That the, that the employer, whether it's a bank, 
whether it's, whether it's a doctor's office, whether it's a newspaper, that its mission is greater than the bottom line. They want to make money, but they want it to be about more than the bottom line. So they share that with those generations. They're also like those generations, very purpose-driven, not just at work, in their lives. They're also, because the times they're living in, they understand things aren't going to come easy. I know we would talk about how they're spoiled and entitled, but then again, isn't everybody spoiled and entitled when they're in their 20s? <laughs> but generationally, over the course of their lives, they have showed that they understand things aren't going to come easy, and they're bootstrappers, much like that greatest generation was. Don't tell a millennial something can't be done because it hasn't been done before. Get the hell out of my way, old man. Give me my laptop. Right? They're consensus builders. They were raised in a shared economy. My kids, when they came to visit me in D.C. before I moved back to Detroit, when they come to visit us, they would stay in somebody else's house and they, they gave out their house to somebody else. I can't fathom that. I stay in hotels. My son plays video games with people, not just plays video games with people all over the world. He creates video games with people all over the world and then plays them together. He's in a shared economy. So it's a generation that at work, at home, in their communities, is more consensus building than Gen X or baby boomers were. They're globally connected. My neighborhood was at Seven Mile and Gratiot. I was born on the same block my mom and dad were on the east side. Isn't that sick? <laughs> that was my neighborhood, Heilman Park. My, my world until I went to U of D was a three block radius that my parents grew up in. My kids, your kids, the millennials, are globally connected. They're global citizens. They're addicted to choice. They demand choice. You grew up at a time when you, if you liked the one, one song by one singer saying, Mr. Mayor, you had to buy a whole album with all 13 songs on it, and 12 of them you didn't like or know, right? This generation grew up at a time when they expect to have 25,000 songs on their hip from 30,000 different artists. They demand choice. My generation, me specifically, I hate change. I grew up at a time, again, <laughs> seven mile grass shit. The world didn't change much for me, especially a white guy my age. Didn't change much for me. I didn't want things to change. I liked the way the world was. This generation, they demand change. What scares them, as much as it scares me about being in change, what scares a typical millennial is being a part of something that isn't changing. Whether it's the Chamber of Commerce, whether it's your law firm, whether it's my news organization, whether it's a sports team, whether it's a college university, if you're not changing, you're going to lose the millennial generation. So it really opened up my eyes that about the time that I was raising my young millennials <laughs> at how this generation was really being underappreciated, and, and, and how we had to understand them better if we wanted to recruit them into our places of employment, and if we wanted to learn how the heck to get out of their way and let them rebuild the institutions that aren't, haven't adapted to the times, and especially being a political writer all these years. You want to talk about an institution that has not been disrupted, that needs to be disrupted? Let's start with our two parties. <laughs> Let's talk about our political system. Let's talk about things like redistricting and money and politics, institutions that need to be reformed. Why is it that millennials are walking away from politics? because it's an institution that hasn't changed. It's an institution with its only purpose in most places, sir, not here in Livonia, but in D.C., is the next election. It's zero-sum game. If you want to have uh, millennials involved in politics, they're going to have to understand that they can change politics in a fundamental way. And by the way, I'll just close with talking about millennials. With That's the biggest difference. The biggest statistical difference between the millennial generation and the greatest generation, Lincoln's generation, and the founding generation is it is the first civic generation. It is the first blessed generation, the first generation with all these attributes I talked about that does not see politics and government as a way to affect change. Now, in one way, that makes me really sad. I want them changing politics. But another way, I see what they're doing in places like Detroit. I see what they're doing in places like Denver and Washington. I see what they're doing in this country. They're seeing gaps where institutions aren't doing their jobs and they're filling them with amazing social entrepreneurship. I see them trying to climb their way into a C-suite over people like me and change companies. They, they're not affecting politics, but they're trying to affect the world in, in ways that politics won't allow them. Now, I hope they do change politics because that's the only way you can bring that kind of change to, to scale. So how, does this, how is this relevant for here? We're not just going to be talking about Dawn and her generation. I'm sorry, did I pr pronounce it? Vaughn. Vaughn and her generation. See, typical Gen X or baby boomer can't even pronounce a millennial's name right. Um, what we want to talk about here is how all these generations need to fit together. One, one, one key to diversity in this country isn't just racial and, and, and social and economic um, and ethnic diversity. We also have to have generational diversity. How do you have a workplace where you have 
many people working together who come from different walks of life, and because of the times we're raised in and how different those times were, how do they knit themselves together and learn from one another? What is it that a, that a, a millennial could learn from Gen Xers and baby boomers in the silent generation? And what is it could we all learn from the millennials in our workplace? So that's what I would like to talk about today. It's something I'm very curious about. This is a really unusual panel the Chamber's put together for us, and I hope I'm worthy of it. Thank you very much for your time.